cost analysis is an important economic tool that helps us to evaluate projects. So I'm going to tell you about various aspects of benefit cost analysis uh, here today, starting with an outline of some of the elements of benefit cost analysis. So first of all, we need to select a relevant time frame. And we've talked about time frames in a previous session when we were looking at evaluating a project from an individual farmer's perspective. But this time we're looking at a, at a larger, probably from a government or public perspective. Um, so the time frame might be 20, 50, 100 years, depending on the project. Then we need to establish a benchmark. And this is quite tricky. This is about what would have happened in the absence of the project that we're trying to evaluate. We need to predict that. Uh, then we need to predict how would things be different if we do the project. Uh, and from that, what would be the benefits and costs that result from the project being causing something to change in the real world. Then we need to convert those benefits and costs into dollar terms in each year. Uh, and then calculate um, present values and select those projects with the highest benefit cost ratio until the budget's exhausted. So that's the general approach we're going to take. Now let's look a little bit more at some of the details. So uh, I want to focus on this issue of establishing a benchmark because it's really important. It's an important way of thinking about evaluating uh, a project. In this diagram I'm showing over time the benefits that arise from a particular project to restore a piece of degraded uh, environmental uh, vegetation, say. So in this case, in the absence of the project, we've made a judgment that the quality of that in piece of environment, that environmental asset, would, be, would stay constant. It's been degraded and it would just stay at about the same level of quality, so its, it's value wouldn't really change. But if we do the project, uh, then the, the condition of the environment will improve a bit and so there will be some benefit that occurs. So the difference between those two lines over time is the measure of the benefits in that particular year. Here's a different example though. It doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the case that if we do nothing then the environment will stay the same. Uh, it, it's often in the case in fact that in the absence of some sort of management action the environment could degrade. And that's what you can see with the red line in this case. Over time, the environmental asset that we're representing here is getting worse. And if we do the project, then there is still some reduction in the environmental condition, but it's not as bad as it would have been if we hadn't done something. So that blue line, by the end of the time period, is actually a bit lower than it was at the start but it's higher than it would have been if we'd done nothing. So the project does have some benefits. So it's, it's important to recognise that a project can give benefits even if the condition of the environmental asset is declining. So it's, that means this, this concept, this approach of looking with versus without the project is really crucial. It's also worth recognising that what we're doing here is we're not comparing, uh, we're not trying to estimate the benefits by comparing the environmental asset condition before and after the project, we're doing it with versus without the project. These are really different concepts and they can give quite different results. With versus without is what matters, not before versus after. Here's another example where the environment is degrading in the absence of the project, but with the project in place it actually improves. So we've got a combination of protecting this environmental asset and restoring it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a nice example, and in this case the benefits are much bigger than we've seen in either of the previous two examples. But it's also worth observing that the benefit that we want to recognise as being attributable to the project is only the difference between the with project and without project example. It's not the full benefits that an environmental asset generates. You know, we don't rec represent the benefits as the height of the blue line above zero, it's only the height of the blue line above the red line. So you don't want to trick yourself into thinking that the project is better than it really is. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is a bit different. This is about converting those benefits into some sort of value that we can use in the benefit cost analysis. Right, so this is not 
necessarily straightforward. Converting some of the environmental and social benefits into a currency value, a dollar value, it can be quite tricky. Um, and a great example of that is trying to put a dollar value on biodiversity benefits. It's really a tricky thing to do. And there are a number of options that people use to attempt to represent these benefits in, in an evaluation, uh, whether it be a full-blown benefit cost analysis or some sort of simplified version. So one approach that some people use is to quantify the benefits in biological terms and to leave it at that, not to make any attempt to convert those into, into dollar values. And in some situations that can be quite a reasonable thing to do, um, particularly if you're trying to compare biological values from different projects that are essentially similar. You know, if, 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 if you're looking at different versions of a project that all are trying to improve uh, the habitat for birds, then it's not too bad to try and leave, to leave those as some representation of benefits for birds and not worry about what they might be worth in dollars. And just recognise that, that there are some inherent weaknesses in there, but you're avoiding some of the difficulties of converting it to dollars. Another approach that's sometimes used is a scoring system of the benefits. And that helps you to compare projects that might be a little bit more different. And usually that's done by some experts uh, judging the benefits and, uh, and uh, assigning scores to them. The next common approach is a deliberative process. There's approaches like uh, citizens juries or just expert judgment that uh, try and um, assign some dollar value to uh, an outcome, an environmental or social outcome just based on a gut feeling or, or on, ne on an expert judgment, um, well informed by all the information that's, that's available. And the final approach is one that uh, environmental economists would generally probably prefer, and that's non-market valuation. Uh, so these are methods that have been developed by economists um, to try and put dollar values on these tricky environmental and social outcomes. And there's a variety of approaches that are used, some based on surveys, some based on observing the behaviour of uh, people in, in the real world. And so, um, again, there are strengths and weaknesses of this approach, just like there are to all the approaches that I've talked about here. And which one you would prefer in a particular case is a matter of judgement. So it's worth spending some time learning about each of these approaches and their strengths and weaknesses so that you can judge which is the best approach to use in a particular case. So. In summary, benefit cost analysis is a widely used tool to evaluate uh, potential projects. It, it requires the comparison of outcomes with versus without the project. And that's an approach that is very important. Uh, a lot of approaches for evaluating projects actually don't do that. And they are really seriously flawed in many cases if they don't do that. And then we talk briefly about a variety of approaches to uh, try and put values, represent the values of the environmental benefits that come out of these types of projects.